The topic before me today is uh, development economics, um, the Austrian contribution. Now, <clears throat> the subject of development economics um, really is not, uh, has, has quite a sh much shorter history than economics in general, right? I mean, economics itself is one of the youngest of all um, the sciences, but development economics as a field within the broader field of economics has an even shorter life. Um, it really exploded and came into life soon after the end of World War II. Um, and it's associated very um, deeply or in, uh, with the, you know, the fact that lots of colonized countries in Asia and Africa um, won their independence. Um, and you know, there was a huge wave of decolonization that occurred um, starting soon after the end of World War II. Um, now, there were many forces um, and groups of people driving this uh, process by which you know, people were getting interested in trying to understand how would we make, um, and in those days it was called the underdeveloped uh, parts of the world. Today we, um, in more politically correct language, call it the developing parts of the world. Um, whatever term you wish to use, uh, how do countries that are poorer, how do you get them to be rich, right? How do you get them to develop economically? Um, now, the main groups of people interested in these questions or the driving force, you know, uh, making this question more and more prominent within the economics profession was, of course, first and foremost, the economists themselves, um, right? Um, th there's this new phenomenon that Countries who were once ruled by colonial powers are now becoming independent. Um, and economists started pondering, well, how, what, what policies um, should we uh, you know, recommend that these countries es espouse so that they become richer, um, just the way the West became rich you know, um, as a result of industrialization and all of those other forces um, at work. Also within the uh, developing countries or the, the, the countries that had just won their independence themselves, there was a lot of interest in this question, um, largely driven by the movements, the nationalistic movements that uh, won the independence in the first place. Um, a great example of that is uh, my own country, India. Um, the, the movement to throw the British out of India, um, led by names such as uh, Mahatma Gandhi and uh, Jawaharlal Nehru, uh, individuals you might have heard about, um, that 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 movement was itself um, an intellectual movement. It was a movement where you know, people were asking, well, how do we rectify the problems with poverty um, in, in, you know, in our country? How do we get uh, India to become like England or the United States? Um, or in those days, they thought Russia was, uh, the erstwhile Soviet Union was getting really rich because they believed those GDP numbers um, coming out of there. Uh, we'll, we'll get to that point later. Um, <clears throat> and of course, there was the whole wave of, um, international organizations that were set up soon after the end of World War II. You had the United Nations, you had uh, you know, the WTO in an earlier format, um, and, and lots of economists who were there were also interested um, in these questions. Now it's unfortunate that these questions rose to prominence at a time when the Austrian school um, was at its probably um, the lowest point in its intellectual history, right? I mean, you had very uh, few um, important uh, or prominent um, economists who were Austrian and who were uh, uh, prominent in, in, in intellectual life. Of course, Mises was alive and Hayek were alive, but um, they didn't hold um, you know, the prominence that they did before. Um, and as a school, it was probably at its lowest point um, in the 40s and 50s. Um, and that's when these questions really started becoming important. So in a, in a way, when economists started theorizing about these questions in the 50s um, and 60s, uh, lots of insights that the Austrian school of thought could have offered, you know, were not incorporated into those theories. And so in a sense, my lecture is sort of trying to uh, give a background as well as give a short exposition of those insights, right? What, what, uh, what insights from the Austrian school or uh, various theories of the, or, or different parts of the Austrian edifice um, that you've been, you know, imbibing through the week, um, how could they shed some light on this question of, you know, what do you do uh, to make countries develop or to get them to be rich, right? Now, of course, the key question here, as you'd notice, or the key subject being, uh, being discussed is that of economic growth, right? So economic development or development economics, first and foremost, has to deal with the problem of economic growth, which is um, how, and by economic growth, one, uh, I define that not just as mere increases in the levels of output, but as increases in standards of living, 
So increases in the, the range, the variety, the quantity, and the quality um, of consumer goods available. So ultimately, growth is about improved consumption, improved living standards. Um, so for example, you might think, uh, or you can do an intellectual exercise of you know, comparing the average consumption basket you know, of an American, average American today, and compare that to say 1850, or compare that to 1900, right? That basket looks a lot different today than it did then. More goods, better goods, right? Uh, the same goods with better quality, um, and, and that's what we're talking about when we're talking about economic growth, right? So the question that, the central question that development economics has to answer is, well, how can you get countries that are poorer, right, in terms of consumption, to the standards of the United States and the West, right? So, and that's the core aspect um, of the subject that I will be discussing today. Now, I should note to be, uh, I should prefer, uh, you know, before I get into the core of my lecture, I should note that some aspects that Austrian economists, especially recently, have discussed with respect to development, I will not be covering. Um, so, for example, there is a huge literature, some of you might be aware of it, um, on the institutional structure um, undergirding growth, especially the origin of institutions. So, for example, if we will discuss um, aspects of what sort of institutions are important for economic growth to take place. But of, uh, recently, led uh, especially by uh, Professor Betke, many economists in, in the Austrian tradition have been asking the question of, well, how do these institutions, which uh, we, we know are needed for growth to take place, how do they arise? Right? How, how, are they, how do they come about? Um, can you, for example, um, impose them from the outside? like say the World Bank tries to do, or the IMF tries to do in developing countries? If not, what are the uh, you know, underlying forces that cause say, private property rights and the rule of law to emerge? Now these are fascinating questions, but um, unfortunately I won't get into those um, in this lecture. I will be focused more on the core um, economic insights that Austrian economics can offer for growth. <clears throat> now to just understand the magnitude of what we're talking about and how important it is, um, this is a quote by Robert Lucas, who was the father of uh, the Rational Expectations Revolution in macroeconomics. Um, he's talking about, in a paper he wrote about growth and economic development, um, he says, I do not see how one can look at figures like those of GDP growth without seeing them as representing possibilities. Is there some action a government of India could take that would lead the Indian economy to grow like Indonesia's or Egypt's? If so, what exactly? If not, what is, what is it about the nature of India that makes it so? The consequences for human welfare involved in questions like these are simply staggering. Once one starts to think about them, it is hard to think about anything else. And of course, uh, you know, if you start thinking about this, uh, you agree with Lucas. Um, so just think about how the standard of living, even today, of the average person in America is so much greater than um, the standards of living of the richest king or queen in Europe, say, three centuries ago. Well, how did that happen, right? What are the forces making you know, that possible? Uh, that's a fascinating question and affects so many millions of people. In fact, even today, there are parts of the world where if you want to get a picture of how Europe looked in the medieval era, you can go to parts of India, you can go to parts of uh, Russia, you can go to parts of Africa, and you will get a picture of exactly what life was like um, in medieval Europe or even early modern Europe. Right? So um, it's still this, this question, if you know, we, can, we can get some consensus on it and understand it, affects millions and millions of lives um, all over the globe, even today. So before I get to the core um, of what Austrian economics or the, the school uh, you know, of Austrian economic thought has to offer on these subjects, let's step back a bit and let's you know, engage in some, uh, an, an analysis of an imaginary construct, which is you know, analyzing the world of Robinson Crusoe. You might have already encountered it this week. Um, it's a neat analytical device simply because we cut out interactions between people, we simplify, and we get to the heart of the interaction between man and his environment and how that's relevant um, for economics. Uh, it's especially important um, in the field of economic growth, as we will see, right? Um, now, if you, some of you might not have heard of Robinson Crusoe, you might uh, think of it more as Tom Hanks in that boring movie, Castaway. <laughs> you know, feel free uh, to do that. <clears throat> I usually say that to my students in class. Um, you know, I was forced to sit through that movie. I hope you weren't. Uh, <laughs> So let's say Robinson Crusoe is stranded on an island and he knows how to produce two goods, say fish and berries. Now let's say that the, met the production methods he adopts are very rudimentary, so you know, he just wades into the ocean and catches fish and he climbs trees to gather berries. Now of course his productivity is really low, 
Um, he acquires a very small bundle of goods for the time that he devotes to production. So his amount of uh, fish or berries per labor hour or per hour worked is going to be really low. Um, so the real question is, uh, that, that kind of sums up the real heart of economic growth or the questions uh, we try to answer there is how can Robinson acquire a larger bundle of consumption, consumer goods, right? How can he become more productive? How can he get more um, goods that he can consume? Now, <clears throat> you might have seen this uh, graph here. This is the pr production possibilities frontier. I'm sure lots of you are familiar with it. Uh, you know, you count the units of one good on, uh, on the y-axis, unit, the units of the other good on the x-axis, and what the, the graph shows you um, is you know, all the combinations of goods on the line are the ones where you're making the best and most efficient use of your resources. Anything that lies outside the frontier right, is unattainable, given the underlying production possibilities. So really the question that we're trying to answer is how can Robinson push his PPF out, right? How can he acquire points like um, N, you know, on the left, on the, on the graph on the left, how can he acquire points on, like N which lie outside his PPF as of today, right? <clears throat> now, one obvious way is for him to work harder. Right? So maybe he was working 10 hours, um, he should work 14 hours, right? Don't change the methods, just work harder. Spend less time talking to your volleyball, right? And, and spend more time and dancing around uh, uh, a bonfire and all of that stuff. Um, and instead, work harder. But of course, this is still un relatively unproductive, right? Of course, he'll, he can, the economy can grow this way. Um, but the, and this is one engine of growth. But nevertheless, um, he's still using the same rudimentary methods. Right? So, so let's ask the other question, which is, <clears throat> how can he push his PPF out by becoming more productive, right? In other words, how, how can he push his PPF out not just by working more hours, but by being more efficient in what he does so that he gets more fish and more berries per hour worked as compared to before? Now, of course, the first step for this to happen is he has to have ideas. Right? He has to know of methods that actually will, if adopted, yield him higher you know, productivity. Right? So this is where um, you know, what economists call technology or techniques of production comes into play. Right? You have to know, say, uh, he might know that if I construct a raft and a net, <clears throat> I can you know, strike out to deeper waters, um, I can cast my net there, and I can spend the same amount of time fishing, but I will get more fish for our work. Right? Um, so he knows of a better technique, a better technology than he, the one he's adopting right now. Similarly, um, he could <clears throat> think that, or he might know that, well, if I just shape you know, a stick um, in, uh, long enough, I can just shake the berries off the tree, I don't need to climb up, that will make me more productive, right? But when you try to adopt better technology, you have to, uh, you know, you, you have to actually put your ideas into action, correct? And, and for that, you need resources. Right, so so when if you if Robinson, for example, wants to switch from producing, um, uh, you know, fish by wading into the ocean with his bare hands, and instead wants to switch over um, into actually producing into, into using a raft and a net, he has to y use resources in order to produce the raft and the net, and then he'll be able to fish longer. Right um, now, <clears throat> these goods like the raft and the net and the stick are capital goods. Uh, again, a term I'm sure you're familiar with, um, defined as the produced factors of production. So labor, for example, is not a produced factor of production. It's given, endowed by nature to Robinson, but the, the raft and the net or the stake are capital goods, right? So he's produced them, and then he's gonna employ them. Not, it, he's not gonna consume these goods, he's gonna employ them in further production. So they're produced factors of production. Now, the key to many of the, the insights that the Austrian school has to offer on economic growth is to ponder the costs and benefits and the trade-offs involved in moving from a less productive process to a more productive process, right? So let's think a little deeper about what all are the costs and benefits involved in Robinson, say, moving from fishing with his bare hands to fishing with a raft and a net, right? As we discussed, he was going to have to devote some amount of his resources to producing the raft and the net first, right? Now, assuming he doesn't work longer or he doesn't decide at the same time to work longer hours, so assuming he has the same number of hours um, as before, you can see straight away that first and foremost, moving from fishing with his bare hands to producing a raft and the net involves an intertemporal choice, right? Produ at, 
when he begins producing the raft and the net, the fish, the consumer good, lies further away in the future as compared to when he would just wade into the ocean, right, and fish with his bare hands, right? So in taking time away from fishing with his bare hands and devoting it to producing, you know, the raft and the net, he is therefore essentially making an intertemporal choice. In other words, he is giving up consumption today, right, or he's reducing his consumption below the maximum level that it could attain today, and instead he is shooting for what he believes will yield him greater consumption in the future. Right, so he's trading off present consumption for future consumption. Right? Now, this process of reducing consumption in the present, allocating resources towards some production process, and then getting more consumption in the future, right, with the goal of getting more consumption in the future, we use the term saving and investing right, to describe this process. So saving refers to the reduction of consumption below its maximum. Investing or investment refers to the actual use of resources to produce or to, uh, you know, obtain the higher consumption in the more distant future, right? You will notice that um, there is an, that, that adopting the more productive process is necessarily more time consuming. That, um, according to the, you know, one of the great insights of uh, Eugen von Bumbauer is one of the sort of givens in our environment, right? We always face the possibility of trading off a shorter less productive production process for a longer, more productive production process, right? But that involves saving and investing. And in fact, if you do not save, then you cannot release the resources needed to put into that longer, more time-consuming process, right? So this is a different way of pushing the PPF out. And it's a way that involves him being more efficient, not just working harder, right, at the same old methods. Now, Karl Menger, the founder of the Austrian School, um, came up with or devised uh, you know, a, a sort of classification for various goods that can be used to satisfy human wants. Um, again, I'm sure you're familiar with this, the, the orders of goods, that the consumer goods are the first order goods, producer goods are what he called the higher order goods, but those higher order goods themselves can be uh, you know, broken up into second, third, fourth, and fifth order of goods and so, uh, so on. So for example, the labor that Robinson uses to produce the fish by wading into the ocean, that labor is a second order good. The fish is a first order or consumer good. When he produces the raft and the net, the labor used to produce the raft and net is a third order good. The raft and the net itself is a second order good and the fish is a first order good, right? So Menger's insight was to not just classify goods into consumer and producer goods, but to classify goods into first order goods and the producer goods to sort of uh, de dehomogenize them um, into an array of different orders of goods. What this helps us see is the temporal connection between something we do today in the production sphere and the consumption that we expect to receive in the future, right? So the higher the order of good that you are engaged in producing, the longer the period of production or the longer the time that is going to need to elapse between the time when you produce that good and the time when your first order good or the consumer good, right, comes to be, right, and so you can consume, all right, um, and in a sense, this gives us a really good typology uh, and a, classificate, a classificatory device to um, help us understand this point that I just made, which is the point of intertemporal decision making, saving, investing, giving up a less, uh, uh, you know, a, a shorter production process for a more time-consuming, excuse me, a longer production process, right? Uh, <clears throat> Menger himself, um, uh, oh, I'll get to that next slide. Uh, before that, let me note that, in a sense, economic growth can be thought of as consistent lengthening of the production structure, right? Consistent, um, or, or one big force making for economic growth, along with the fact that you could work harder, at the same methods, um, is the adoption of techniques that involve more time, right, looking forward into the future. You have to, uh, you're, you're shooting for consumption, greater consumption in the more distant future. Um, you're giving up consumption in the more near future or in the present, all right? Um, and, but in doing so, you're lengthening the production structure of your economy. In, the, in Robinson's case or in you know, Tom Hanks's case, it's a very rudimentary economy. Right, um, but in, in in a modern economy, of course, there are many, many, many decisions made in many different production processes that can lead to such um, growth. Now, Menger had a great has a great quote which sort of sums up how you know this this process of growth. He says, "Assume a people which extends its attention 
to goods of third, fourth, and higher orders instead of confining its activity merely to the tasks of a primitive collecting economy, that is to the acquisition of naturally available goods of the lowest order. We shall see the hunter who initially pursues game with a club turning to hunting with bow and hunting net, to stock farming of the simplest kind and in sequence to ever more intensive forms, forms of stock farming. We shall see men living initially on wild plants turning to ever more intensive forms of agriculture. We shall see the rise of manufacturers and their improvement by means of tools and machines. And in the closest connection with these developments, we shall see the welfare of this people increase. So in other words, a key Austrian insight is that the heart of economic growth lies in consistent lengthening of the production structure, and that involves continuous saving and investing, right? Sacrifice of the present in order to get more in the future. Now, digging a bit more into, uh, into this, Let's now think uh, not of one Robinson, but many different Robinsons, right? Or think of like a whatever Survivor Island series where you have different islands and different guys, right? You have a helicopter. You see one guy is lazy, right? He or, or he he he's you know he's really present oriented. He only wants to do things for the present. He doesn't care about the future. Well, you know he will have a relatively um, underdeveloped economy, right? He he will still be uh, talking to his volleyball a lot. Right? He will still be dancing around the fire a lot. He will still be looking at the stars a lot. He's not really going to have a house. He's not going to have a lot of fish. He's not going to have uh, plenty of berries. Um, maybe he won't have any meat because he wouldn't have constructed bow and arrows, etc. On the other hand, a Robinson who um, is rich, right, is a guy who has saved and invested a lot in the past. He's already done that. He's lengthened the structure of production in the past. And today, he, the, the fruit of that is the capital goods that he has with him that he can then utilize. You know, he has a raft and a net. He has a set of bow and arrows. He has a stick. He has a home, right? Um, now, of course, you will notice that once you see that it's saving and investing and uh, the lengthening of the structure of production that allows you to uh, grow and become richer in this way, that there is a virtuous cycle involved the richer Robinson will now be able to save more and be able to devote a larger part of his overall time to producing more capital goods because his flow of consumer goods is now going to be much larger because of the saving and investing he's done in the past. Right? So if he so desires, of course, he could um, at some point just completely give it all in. You know, he saved and invested a lot in the past. He puts his feet up and says, that's it. You know, that, I'm done. Right? I'm just going to enjoy whatever the fruit of my past labor are. Now, of course, capital goods depreciate, so as soon he'll be poor again, right? Um, but assuming he's not that kind of guy, he remains thrifty, he remains future-oriented, he's able to do more the richer he is. Right? So, so uh, another feature of a developed uh, economy is that you a large share of labor time or a large proportion of labor time or larger and larger proportions are devoted to producing goods that will only you know, of very high order, which will only result in consumer goods well, well into the future, right? So it's a virtuous process involved. So growth is a sort of a virtuous process. The more you produce capital goods, the more you lengthen your structure of production, the more consumption possibilities you have. Therefore, the more possibility for you to reallocate resources from the present to the more distant future, right? And so on and so forth, okay? Now, to give you an idea, and I hope most of you can see this, um, I pulled, uh, there's a great paper written by the Indian economist uh, Sudha Shanoi, um, who was one of the few development um, economists who you know, was very, very Austrian or, or really used the insights of the Austrian um, theory of growth that I just briefly elaborated upon. Um, now, in a paper um, titled Investment Chains um, Through History, um, she what she did was, she was primarily an economic historian, so what she did was she went and she actually looked at the production structures of different economies of different levels of development or, or different levels of growth and consumer welfare, right? And to see, well, how would an economy with like a short, sort of a, not, not, not very long production processes being employed, how would that look? And can we compare that to like a developed economy of today, which of course is very hard to do because the production processes for any good um, in a developed economy like today are, are extremely complex. You have many capital goods and you have many um, you know, different steps involved before consumer goods finally appear. So this is uh, fur garments being produced in Upper Paleolithic Europe. Um, and as you can see, 
you know, if you look at the, the sort of capital goods involved and, and how time consuming the production, their, their production must have been in the past, as well as the number of capital goods involved, the number of stages of production or the steps involved, um, it's, it doesn't look that complex. You know, you still have, uh, you know, stone tools, um, you know, you have uh, bones which have been shaped into butchering, et cetera. Very rudimentary, right? Not, not, don't really require a lot of time consuming production activity. We could, on the other hand, look at uh, millet porridge production in Mali in the late 20th century. Of course, this is a very um, you know, poor economy, but it's in the late 20th century, but it's richer than upper Paleolithic Europe, or it has more sophisticated production processes than upper Paleolithic Europe. And you can see already um, there are more capital goods involved, more stages, more complex production processes, right? Um, so you have things like coal, charcoal, um, you know, you have wood, uh, many, many uh, w goods with wood. You have aluminum vessels, uh, you know, things which require more time consuming production processes, which have, uh, so this is like, this, this Robinson is a little richer than the other Robinson, right? Um, or of course, you could come to cotton ca garments being produced in a developing country in the late 20th century. And this is just a segment of a much longer, um, you know, uh, this, uh, all the goods are listed in the paper. You can you can take a look, but you can see already. I mean, this is there are many more capital goods of um, you know kind of proving the basic point of um, the in, the core insight of Aus the Austrian theory of growth. So uh, one big conclusion we can draw then is that the the act of saving or reducing consumption below its maximum in the present is the sine qua non um, or the absolute necessary uh, precondition for uh, any economic growth to take place. Um, and all extensions to the production structure require more savings. Moreover, the maintenance of the existing capital goods also require persistent savings. So Robinson will have to uh, re you know, take away time from consuming in order to maintain his raft and net, in order to maintain um, his bow and arrow, right? Or even to replace them, right? Replacing capital goods as they depreciate is also a very important aspect of keeping up the levels of or the standards of well-being um, in any um, economy. Um, and, and this point is summed up well um, in a quote by Rothbard, and he's talking about uh, and some, uh, s some modern growth theorists um, take, place a lot of emphasis on technology um, to the exclusion of savings. Rothbard uh, is saying that, well, what is lacking in these developing countries is not knowledge of Western technological methods. Um, that is learned easily enough. The service of imparting knowledge in person or in book form can be paid for readily. What is lacking is the supply of saved capital needed to put the advanced methods into effect. The African peasant will gain little from looking at pictures of American tractors. What he lacks is the saved capital needed to purchase them. That is the important limit on his investment and on his production. <coughs> right, <clears throat> so now let's think a little bit more about the institutional structure needed um, what, what can we say about the institutional structure needed for economic growth to take place? Now, you will notice that any process of growth, even in a poor economy like Robinson's, involves a real transformation of his capital structure, right? So as he uh, lengthens his production, uh, you know, his, his, the production processes in his economy, he's going to transform the capital goods that exist, right? Some of the capital goods he might not replace anymore, or, or he's gonna add to the capital goods that existed before, right? So growth, so if you take snap, a snapshot of a poor Robinson's economy and a rich Robinson's economy, you're gonna see a very different, what uh, Austrian economists call a s s capital structure, a very different structure of capital goods in these two you know, different levels, um, you know, different uh, economies of these rich and poor guys. Uh, now, and the transition from a poor to a rich state involves these sort of transformations or a series of transformations of um, the capital structure. So um, for example, when he decides to allocate an hour of labor time um, from fishing with his bare hands to the production of raft and a net, that's gonna change his capital structure. Now, each step in this transformation involves Robinson to make a decision. He has to make a choice. He has to say, yes, the, 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 the costs of doing so are lower than the expected benefits. Right? So in other words, uh, when he, for example, takes an hour away from fishing with his bare hands to producing the raft and the net, uh, he, he has to make, it, that's an allocative decision. He's making a decision and saying, I will take less fish now, but I will take X number of extra fish in the future, and that makes this uh, decision to take resources away from this process to that process worth it. 
right? So in any decision to allocate producer goods, you need to be able to compare costs and benefits, right? Which, and the costs and benefits must always ultimately lie in consumer goods. So if you're thinking about allocating an hour here or an hour there, you're ultimately deciding on the basis of, well, how much of what consumer good am I going to lose? My cost, my opportunity cost, and how much of, my, uh, of what good am I going to gain? My marginal benefit, right? So he, you have to be able to isolate these costs and benefits in order to make such a decision. Now, <clears throat> and this is what we call economic calculation, right? So uh, the, the, the decisions of Robinson Crusoe to uh, engage in this process of growth to save and invest and, and transform his capital structure involves economic calculation on his part. In other words, he has to calculate the costs and benefits involved in any such decision on how to allocate his resources. Now, there are some characteristics or features of his economy which make economic calculation um, easy, relatively. Right? So for example, his production structure, the, the production processes in his economy are short. Um, there are not too many capital goods involved. There are not too many steps that lie between a certain allocation of labor and the consumer goods that will arise right, in the future. Uh, so for example, um, if he's deciding whether to sacrifice fish now in the form of you know, fishing with his bare hands versus um, fishing, uh, you know, devo devoting that time to producing the raft and the net, he can easily isolate the costs and benefits involved. He can survey the production processes involved and he can isolate, okay, this is how much fish I'm gonna lose in the present, this is how much fish I'm gonna gain in the future, right? And similarly, you can think of other such decisions he might make. He might make a decision, say, to take away an hour um, from uh, fishing today and devote it instead to constructing a house, right? Once again, he can easily see or perceive in his mind the benefits and costs in terms of consumer goods associated with this you know, decision to allocate resources. And therefore, he can make a rational decision. He can make a meaningful decision. Right? That's what we mean when we talk about economic calculation that precedes choice or, or any decision of allocation. Now, <clears throat> you'll even once we move away from the simple economy of Robinson Crusoe and move to a more modern, complex economy, there are some things that stay the same, but there are some aspects of this process that are different, right? So even in a modern economy, the process of growth involves a radical transformation of the capital structure, right? So, um, so for example, a poor economy, uh, people will be, you know, will be spinning cloth with, their, you know, with some rudimentary machine that you have to use your hands with, uh, right? Or in a modern economy, on the other hand, you'll see that being done with automated machinery. Um, in a poor economy, someone will be, uh, you know, whipping his, you know, the ox or the cow to, to plow the land, but in a modern economy, he'll be sitting, uh, you know, happily in his tractor, right? Uh, so you can see, again, if you take a snapshot of a poor versus a rich, modern, complex economy, you see a very different sort of capital structure. So again, growth involves transformations in capital structures, even in a modern economy. But this process now becomes much more complex. You have many, many more production processes. You have some of them very, very long, Right? Um, many, many capital goods must be produced before your consumer good finally comes to be. Right? <clears throat> and because of that, economic calculation is no longer possible right, the way Robinson was engaging in it. In a modern, so for example, um, and this of course cuts to the heart of something again which I'm sure uh, you, you've learned already this week, the calculation debate um, and Mises' argument about how calculation is not possible in a socialist economy. To understand this point, think of the difference between Robinson making that decision in that simple economy and, say, uh, the czar of a uh, you know, socialist economy who's deciding whether or not he should allocate, say, a, a, a ton of coal uh, to producing more electricity, right, or to, say, producing more steel, right? Now, in order to do that, just the way Robinson had to do, he had to, he, in his mind, he has to isolate the costs and benefits involved. He has to be able to trace through and say, if I devote this ton of coal to producing uh, electricity, this is the consumer goods that I will get at the end of you know, a very long process with many steps, right? many interconnected uh, production possibilities involved there. Right? Um, and on the other hand, you have to do the same thing for um, the steel. Now, of course, you can see that this is not going to be possible for any you know, normal human being to do who's not, uh, who doesn't, who's not blessed with superhuman powers. Right, so because of that, one comes to another very important conclusion again that Austrian economics has for growth. Saving and investing is very important for growth, but that, for, for that saving and investing to actually make 
any difference to people's lives in terms of their, in their roles as consumers in the economic system, you have to have the right institutional structure, right? Now, how do you get the answer to what the right institutional structure is? Simply because if you cannot engage in economic calculation in this complicated setting the way Robinson did, so you, you cannot just compare in kind, right? Um, you know, this consumer goods versus that consumer goods, what I'm gaining or losing, right? You need a common denominator to be able to engage in economic calculation, and that's produced by money prices and private property in the factors of production, right? So uh, given these institutional conditions, the growth process will actually be driven by private entrepreneurs, right? It's the private entrepreneurs guided by money prices, right, engaged in their economic calculation. Their costs will be so much money lost their benefit will be so much money gained. They do not need to l think about what the final consumer goods gained and lost are. They, they don't need to engage in that process, which intellectual process, which a czar of, the, of a Soviet economy would have to engage in, right? So th they, they, their decision is simplified, but also they get a common denominator because um, you know, if, if you, otherwise they wouldn't be able to compare, say, a ta a so much electricity versus so much coal uh, versus so much steel. Right, so if you're allocating a ton of coal, you can, if you can somehow magically know the consumer goods that are contingent upon so much electricity versus so much steel, you can make a decision. But if the production processes are so complex that you can't isolate those costs and benefits, well, what do you, how, how do you make a judgment about electricity versus steel? They're not consumer goods, right? They have no uh, relevance to your satisfaction. You can't say, I prefer this to that. But if you do have a common denominator like money, Right? You can make such a judgment. Right? And that's, that's the key point that Mises is making in his arguments about economic calculation. Now, of course, in, the, in a market system, you have private entrepreneurs calculating using money prices. And of course, the profit loss system rewards those who cater to consumer wants and uh, punishes those who do not. On the other hand, however, um, I've already discussed this. When you don't have these prices, you don't have the profit loss system, this sort of economic calculation becomes impossible. And so making any meaningful decisions in the growth process become impossible. Now let's try to um, look at some of the implications of this for, um, you know, and try to make it relevant to some of the experiences we've had in the 20th century with respect to growth, right? And experiments um, conducted, uh, you know, various socialist experiments construct conducted um, in different countries. Now, <clears throat> what happens of course is that if you cannot, if, if private entrepreneurs aren't there, you know, if on the other hand these markets are suppressed, these decisions are still made on some, there is still some decision criteria going into them, but it hasn't have any relationship to the preferences of consumers. Instead, it's just political whims and fancies, right? You have uh, different interest groups, you have, uh, you know, all the different uh, machinations of power um, emerge um, in this context. Now, <clears throat> What such a system is characterized by, therefore, um, is a rampant uh, malinvestment of the existing capital goods, right, first and foremost. And also, the whole saving and investing process doesn't really produce anything, right? It's like Milton Friedman once, you know, when he went to India uh, in the 50s, he had a great line. Um, he looked at all the dams and all the big factories being constructed, and he said, yeah, they're like the pyramids. You know, they're like, they're like the modern monuments. They, they're not gonna actually result in anything, right? Um, in terms of consumer goods, right? Uh, and why? Because they're conducted in an environment where economic calculation is highly, highly impaired, if not impossible. Um, and you have the state making these decisions. The same would apply to the Soviet Union um, and other countries. Now, it's important to note that GDP can grow when these decisions are made due to political, uh, you know, by those in power in a highly controlled or socialist economy. Right, um, <clears throat> there will be a production of capital goods in the short run. Right, there, there will be a more that you can have increases in output, except that those increases in output will not lead to any increases in what matters, which is consumer goods. Right, it's like it just gets lost in the process. Right? So you'll have factories coming up, um, you'll have dams coming up, you'll have all this stuff, but the the average consumer is still going to be dirt poor. Right, simply because of the impossible because of the lack of um, economic calculation possible. And therefore, what happens is that in such an economy, once you have the, the onset of socialism, you have an increased GDP growth, but that's, that's a result of the consumption of the capital goods in the past. It's almost like Robinson decides, you know what, 
I'm going to use the existing goods I have, right? And maybe assume that those goods can be used to produce other capital goods. So, you know, he has some coal, he has some steel, he has all these things that he can use to produce other capital goods, but I'm just going to produce them without any care or consideration for my consumer welfare, right? about my wants, about my needs. Right? So I can produce a lot of stuff, but I'm not, at the end of that process, there's going to be nothing there for me to consume. So what I've done is I've taken goods that were capital goods and that were, you know, assuming that at some point the socialist era began and before that you had the market-based era, you know, you had resources aligned to consumer preferences through the, 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 the ac actions of private entrepreneurs, right? Um, and then you had the socialist government coming in, you malinvested and consumed all the capital, all the savings, all the investment of the past. And in the process, you, you produce a new structure of, of, of capital, which doesn't have any bearing or any sort of relationship to consumer preferences. Right, so you have malinvestment, and you might have increased GDP growth in the short run, but ultimately you will you'll not have much improvement in the way growth actually matters, which is um, increased consumer welfare. Now, a perfect example of this, of course, is Venezuela. Um, for example, Joseph Stiglitz went to Venezuela uh, a few years ago, and he said, "Oh, the economic growth looks pretty impressive, right?" Except now you have you know, people killing rat, uh, dogs and cats in the streets trying to, you know, make ends meet because they, they, want, to, they want to eat. Uh, you don't have any, uh, you know, goods on the, on the grocery shelves, uh, you know, in, in the supermarkets. People are flooding, uh, you know, uh, moving, running across the border uh, to try to get essentials. Uh, of course, we've seen this before. We've seen this in the Soviet Union. Um, we've seen this um, in India as well when, you know, India um, engaged in a huge amount of, uh, during the socialist era. So this is the, but, but this intellectual structure that the Austrian school has given us helps us to understand what's going on here, right? Yes, you do have more production. Yes, you do, you know, a lot of that production does go in uh, to new capital goods, but that doesn't result in any improved consumer well-being. Now, to, you know, I've done some research on India on these points, um, and I'll have to skip through um, some of the slides here because I'm running out of time, but I want to get through the main um, <clears throat> You know, some of the, the data on what actually went on. So India had its you know, real peak socialist phase in the 50s and 60s, a lot of it ironically guided by the development economists who you know, came on the scene then, uh, <clears throat> who said, well, you have to do a lot of saving and investing. If you want to rapidly grow, you have to save and invest a lot. But you know, the state has to guide everything. It all has to be state driven. Um, and that's what you know, India did. And what you can see here, for example, the, the difference in the production you know, rate of growth of output over the decade of 55 to 65 um, in the capital goods and basic industries like, again, uh, capital goods really, um, versus the different consumer goods, whether agricultural or non-agricultural, right? But you also see stagnation of living standards. So for example, the per capita um, availability of food grain um, or of cloth did not significantly improve in the 50s or 60s, but importantly, didn't improve later as well in 70s or 80s. Or, you know, uh, India was still very, very poor even in the 90s. It's not like India was super rich because of this investment made in the 50s and 60s. So what happens then is something like this, if you go back to your PPF. Now, in a country like India, the, 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 the logic is reduce, you know, take away resources from agriculture, Right, and invest them in longer production processes in industrial production. Let's let's make uh, factories to make steel, and let's make factories to make uh, heavy duty machinery, and all of that stuff. And the the logic of it is that afterwards you should get a point outside your PPF. But what happens is the PPF collapses. Right, and that's what happens when you have malinvestment and capital consumption of the existing resources. Right, and again. We see the two main lessons you know, that, that come out of the work of the Austrian school is helping understand um, this process. Um, so my time is up now, so I will stop. Uh, thank you for your attention. <laughs>